From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Attorney General Merrick Garland picks a special prosecutor to investigate Donald Trump. Does this increase the chances that the former president is indicted? Plus, John Kerry and President Biden sign the U.S. up for a new fund to pay climate reparations to poor countries for the sin of using fossil fuels over many decades to develop. Will this end up being another burden on American taxpayers? Welcome. I'm Paul Gigo with the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. And I'm here with my colleagues, Kyle Peterson and Joseph Sternberg. Hello to you both. Let's start with the Merrick Garland naming a special counsel. His name is Jack Smith, a career prosecutor with experience investigating corruption cases, among others. Now at The Hague in the Netherlands at the World Criminal Court, he'll be handling both the case of the documents that the former president had taken to Mar-a-Lago and stored there and the issue of whether anyone interfered with the counting of the Electoral College votes on January 6th or with the transfer of power in Washington after an election. He will not be handling the cases that are already being handled by a U.S. attorney against the rioters on January 6th, the people who breached the Capitol that day. So presumably, Jack Smith's investigation will be whether there was a larger conspiracy to block the electoral vote counting and the transition of power, transfer of power by Donald Trump or others could be members of Congress. Let's listen to Merrick Garland explain why he's doing this. Based on recent developments, including the former president's announcement that he is a candidate for president in the next election and the sitting president's stated intention to be a candidate as well, I have concluded that it is in the public interest to appoint a special counsel. Such an uh, an appointment underscores the department's commitment to both independence and accountability in particularly sensitive matters. It also allows prosecutors and agents to continue their work expeditiously and to make decisions indisputably guided only by the facts and the law. Kyle, uh, the attorney general making the case there that this is going to essentially guarantee independence of the prosecutorial judgment in this matter and give some insulation between himself as the AG and, and by implication, President Biden in any decision to prosecute or not. Do you think this will indeed provide that insulation? Well, I don't think that anyone who is skeptical of this kind of prosecution is going to buy the insulation argument. And already last week, you had a spokesman for President Trump saying, quote, this is totally expected political stunt by a feckless, politicized, weaponized Biden Department of Justice, unquote. And so I think that if there's an indictment that is handed down by the special counsel, there will be a big chunk of the country that feels like the fix was in and that this was intended. So I don't think the insulation that Merrick Garland is, the political insulation that he's hoping for is going to come. But to the extent that he's looking for independence, that's also a problem, I think, because The prosecutorial power in the United States is an executive power, and all of it, if you're going to have political accountability, has to flow down from the president to the attorney general to the prosecutors that are working under him. And so my understanding is that we don't have the old independent counsel law anymore. Now we have the special counsel authority, but that means that this prosecutor, Jack Smith, Ultimately, he's not under day-to-day oversight by the Justice Department, but he still is ultimately accountable to the attorney general, and the attorney general can overturn whatever decision he makes to charge or not to charge. And so I think that's good from the constitutional sense of we no longer have that independent counsel law that Justice Antonin Scalia was so presciently critical of. But it does also mean that the kind of insulation that Merrick Garland is counting on seems like it is sort of a political PR insulation more than anything that is reflected in the facts on the ground. Let's listen to Donald Trump respond to the appointment. The corrupt and highly political Justice Department just appointed a super radical left special counsel, better referred to as a special prosecutor to start the process all over again. We thought it was just about dead. As you know, uh, just about the top person, one of the top people in the Justice Department, Lisa Monaco, a major Trump hater, major, I mean, beyond belief, is in charge of the case, and she's totally controlled by 
Andrew Weissman. Do you ever hear the name Andrew Weissman? I think you did. In this room, you did. Bad person, bad guy, but he's an even bigger Trump hater. Sounds like a fair deal so far. Do you agree? Well, taking it well, Joe. But Andrew Weissman, of course, he's right about Andrew Weissman's role in the uh, running the Robert Mueller special counsel probe. But I don't think Weissman has anything to do with this one. And the comments by Trump give you a flavor of the fact whether or not Garland is sincere in appointing somebody like this, it's not going to work to give him even the appearance of independence because, as Kyle said, people aren't going to believe it. And so my preference would have been for Garland to, if I can use the phrase, man up and just make a decision himself. And this is going to be perceived by half the country or more as a decision ultimately of the president of the United States, Joe Biden, through his attorney general, essentially going after a man who is running for president, campaigning against the sitting president. There's no way to escape that. And therefore, you have to, I think, face that, confront it, and then make a decision based on that political reality. Exactly. And the political component of this is, I think, the, thing, the, the most important part of that. And keeping in mind here that the legal system is not the only potential remedy if Trump has, in fact, done something wrong. You also have the possibility of political hygiene. And in fact, until the special prosecutor announcement, that seemed to be the direction that we had some hope of heading. Trump had been rebuffed as candidates in the midterm election, you know, two, three weeks ago, precisely because voters were signaling that they were exhausted with the Trump circus. His announcement for president last week seemed to be falling flat because voters were exhausted with the Trump circus. And now you have the Justice Department potentially short-circuiting that political process, which you can't rely on elections to solve all legal problems. And I think that politicians do sometimes uh, do things that require criminal prosecution. But I think that uh, the art of prosecuting also requires a certain amount of prudence. And that might be, don't step in and intervene if at the moment it appears that voters are in the process of imposing some discipline themselves. The issue here with the decision whether or not to prosecute Donald Trump strikes me as fundamentally not one of independence by the special counsel or Merrick Garland. It's about judgment. It's about the wisdom of prosecuting a former president who is now running for president against the sitting president. Is this a wise decision in the best interest of the United States? So my threshold here is, is the criminal charge, the alleged offense, serious enough to warrant the extraordinary step never undertaken in American history to indict a former president? And is the evidence of that criminal behavior so compelling that it will persuade not only Democrats, who are the political opposition to the president, but fair-minded Republicans. Because the gravity of this kind of indictment is going to echo through our politics. Because once you do this, the door will be opened. Future acts of this kind, prosecution by the Republicans against Democrats. It will inevitably, this is what happens. So the question becomes, Kyle, do you think right now that there is, in fact, enough evidence? Jack Smith could be an altar boy. He could be Elliot Ness. He could be, you know, St. Francis of Assisi. But it doesn't matter if the public doesn't perceive this indictment as fair. And do you think there's enough evidence right now to make that kind of persuasive indictment and case against Donald Trump? Well, let me take them one at a time, because the first investigation is into the Electoral Count Act and what happened on January 6th. I still don't know what crime we're talking about here with regard to President Trump. I mean, obviously, anybody who rioted and assaulted a police officer and was in the building unlawfully, the Justice Department can and should and has been going after those people and prosecuting them. But there's been no indication so far that President Trump had any communications with the Proud Boys, with any of the rioters, anything like that. There's been some discussion of potentially a crime of obstructing Congress for what President Trump did. I find that to be pretty far-fetched because the president is in the middle of the political process. And I mean, I think that it's lamentable the pressure that he put on Mike Pence on January 6th to throw out electors or to, to delay the counting of the electoral votes. 
but I don't see how that is obstruction of Congress by a president and vice president talking about what actions they should take in the middle of the political arena. As far as the classified documents goes, it's fascinating because one of the questions that goes to the point about the prudential issue, whether this is the kind of thing that you ought to be charging, is what were in the classified documents. It was notable over the weekend to me that former Attorney General Bill Barr said in an interview, he said, I personally think they probably have the basis for legitimately indicting the president. I don't know, I'm speculating, but given what's gone on, I think they probably have the evidence that would check the box, unquote. That's interesting to me because I generally take Bill Barr to be a straight shooter on the question of law. And I still don't know why President Trump didn't just return the materials when the archives asked for them. But the million dollar question to me, whether the public would accept that, is whether the stuff that was at Mar-a-Lago were pretty low level things that President Trump thought of as mementos or whether there was really national security information there. And we still don't have the answer to that question. Well, your point about checking the box, that's not enough in my view. You can indict somebody for all kinds of things. And I have no doubt that if there's an indictment here, the Justice Department is probably confident they can get a District of Columbia jury to convict Donald Trump. But the question is, can you get the public or half of the public to be persuaded that this is in fact justified? And in that case, you have to do more than check the box. And I think under the Presidential Records Act, I mean, fundamentally, you've got two issues, right? Did he have the right to have those documents? He certainly has the right to have them at some point. Once they were requested to return them, did he obstruct justice in lying to the Justice Department, disguising them or hiding them somehow? which is a more serious charge, but still fundamentally it's about document fight. And are you really going to indict the former president over a dispute over documents? And keep in mind, the Presidential Records Act has very minimal sanctions for violations. So I think that's the evidence that you need to have is much more significant than what I've seen so far. Now, look, they could come up with a lot of different uh, behavior that we don't know about. But this is a very fraught decision by Jack Smith going forward, the new special counsel.